So welcome everyone to today's second lecture in financial risk management. We talked a lot about the definition of risk management and what is risk uh, last week. Um, I told you some of the theoretical background um, when it comes to risk management and basically all you need to know is that financial risk management is closely related to capital structure and the theoretical argument that um, can be stated on the necessity of risk management and why firms should engage in risk management are basically the same as with corporate capital structure. Um, but now let's turn to the second chapter and let's talk more about what types of financial risks financial institutions in particular and industrial companies in general are exposed to. And as you can see from the outline, we'll talk about financial versus real and real economic risks. Then we'll turn to market price risk, credit risk, operational risk, liquidity risk, um, and actuarial risk as a special case, but we only talk about two on actuarial, about actuarial risk for like two slides. And then I'll talk about model risk um, a little bit. Okay, next slide, yeah. Now, first of all, as you probably have noticed by now, this is a class on financial risk management. Um, we distinguish just like in neoclassic uh, theory between financial risk and real economic risk. Real economic risk being the risk that you lose your job, that a firm uh, doesn't make uh, any new sales, um, that uh, an economy will go down. Uh, and in contrast, financial risks are such risks that uh, originated in the investment and financing sphere of the firm. So. Every time a company, a firm, interacts with financial markets, you might be exposed to financial risk. And these financial risks can be in uh, the form of credit risk, market risk, uh, liquidity risk, and so on. So we'll see that market prices may change. We can see that uh, default intensities and default rates change. And these uh, changes in an economy, they cause an exposure to financial risk in contrast to real economic risk. Um, you can also look at it the other way around. Um, there's a, um, a very recent trend in research that looks at real effects of decisions made in the financing sphere of a company or made in financial markets. What does it mean? If you take a bank, say a Sparkasse, a savings and loan association. A bank will take in deposits, it will give out loans, and you can stop there and say, well, the bank in, engages in financial markets. The question then is, what are the real effects of lending? And that is what um, currently central bankers and policymakers are most concerned about. The European Central Bank has expanded credit and expanded uh, its monetary policy. It gives out cheap capital to banks, expecting that banks will give out loans to companies, companies will invest, companies will invest and these investments will create jobs and then you will have a real economic effect, new jobs. But here we are talking about financial risk, we are not talking about real effects and not really directly about real economic risk. That would be, for example, employees are fired, jobs will be lost, and so on. So it's just about financial risk. Also related to credit risk and liquidity. All these subcategories, credit risk, market risk, etc., cetera, um, they all have in common that they do not arise directly from the business activities of the firm, but from the cash flows generated by the operations. You give out a loan, you invest in uh, an asset, um, you have more or less liquidity, and because you have a certain stream of cash flows, you might be exposed to financial risk. Another common feature of all of these risks is that they represent a potential loss. I've talked about this extensively last week, that you can argue that only a firm should be only concerned about financial losses, but you can make the argument that Every time something is abnormal, it could also pose a threat to the company. If you have a trader that earns too much money, 
if you have someone who is doing too well, if something's too good to be true, it might also be a risk. But most of the time, we'll only talk about financial losses. And that leads us to what is done in quantitative risk management. In quantitative risk management, usually you only deal with random variables, because risk is stochastic in nature, and loss distributions. So a random variable that captures financial potential, financial losses. And that's also the, the, the starting point in actuarial science. Who of you is taking the insurance classes, by the way? Anyone? Okay, let's, because I'm recording this, everyone is taking the insurance classes. In insurance, you make a, a clear distinction between two lines of business, life, non-life. Insurance is almost bipolar. Health insurance and life insurance is completely different from non-life. In health insurance, you're insuring your life. It's almost like a deposit contract or it's a an health insurance, uh, meaning that you're trying uh, to estimate the probability that someone gets sick, someone dies from an, uh, from an illness and so on. And then you have life insurance. The probability that the the projector comes down, the probability that your bike is stolen, the probability that you run your car against the wall. Completely different types of risk and completely different business. And insurance, especially non-life insurance, it's almost the same onset as in quantitative risk management. You only want to estimate the losses that can arise from non-life insurance contracts. The probability of a flood, the probability of a fire, the probability of a car accident. And then it's all about quantitative risk management and non-life insurance. I can assure you, we, you, we will not talk about quantitative risk management here. We will only deal with option pricing later on because it's such an important part of hedging. But um, in the masters, the master's level, you might be so lucky or so unlucky that at some point in the future you can uh, take a quantitative risk management class with me, but um, here you're lucky. You will not be forced to deal with quantitative risk management. That's usually something that's done by mathematicians. So let's start with real economic risk. I, I said that we are not really dealing with real economic risk. Loss of jobs, um, something that affects your revenues. In fact, this usually entails the entrepreneurial risk. I told you this last week that we are, although this is called risk management, we will not be dealing with the risk that you are not a good entrepreneur. If you don't know your business, if you don't know your customer, you might be risking the bankruptcy of your firm, but there's nothing risk management can deal. You need to take a class in management, but not in risk management. Um, however, there are some real economic risks that can arise. A disruption of production, uh, if it's due to accidents, thefts, floods, disasters, fires, and similar incidents. So some of these real economic risks, you will see them later on in what we call operational risk, op risk. So that's the risk that, again, the projector falls down and production of knowledge in this room is this. Disrupted. Yeah, weird example. So that's op risk. Again, risk management is not really able to deal with real economic risks, and definitely not with strategic risks and entrepreneurial risk. If you don't know your business, if you don't know your market, you will go out of business. But risk management is not concerned about that. Okay, let's just skip the discussion. Um, and concentrate on how risk is classified and categorized in banking. I, I told you that, well, this class is obviously in part based on banking and it's supposed to, to give you some idea of what, what goes on in banking. However, risk management and financial risk management is very general and can be found in many industrial firms. The problem or the advantage in banking is 
that banks are forced to report on their risk management. Other companies are not required to report on the risk management. They might, the perfume store actually, yeah, it, it might do risk management, but because it's, an, it's, it's a rather boring industry compared to banking, and it's not super, it doesn't, it doesn't have uh, supervision and regulation, there are no legal statutes that require the perfume store to uh, report on its risk management. It's totally different in banking. So if you look at the annual report of a bank, you will see a so-called risk report, Risikobericht. And in the risk report of Deutsche Bank, a prime example of a bank that definitely has a lot of risks, uh, in this risk report from 2013 of Deutsche Bank, you can see they give an indication of what types of risk they have on their balance sheet. Credit risk, market risk, op risk, and some diversification effect. I'm sorry if you only have the German extract, but for Deutsche Bank, just go for the English version on the internet. They also have an, their annual report in English on the website. So credit risk, market risk, and op risk. Again, you can see the distinction into three different types of risk that stems from the Basel II regulation. Does anyone, maybe someone who has taken the, the class on banking last semester, does anyone know what, why Basel, Basel, Regulierung in banking? Well, first, Basel is a city, but why is it called Basel and Basel II? Basel II, we've now come to Basel III and then Basel IV. Why Basel? The argument and the reason goes like this. Basel, the Swiss city Basel, uh, on the German-Swiss border, is what is located in Basel. as a famous institution headquartered in Basel. Basel. No one? Basel uh, is the city where the Bank for International Settlements is headquartered. The Bank for International Settlements in German Bank for Internationalen Zahlungsausgleich, the BIS, is usually referred to as the Central Bank of Central Banks. It was initially founded to, um, how can I say it? The, the BIS was initially founded after the First World War to make sure that Germany pays up the reparations after the First World War to France, the U Britain, UK, uh, and everyone else that was victorious in World War I. It evolved from that and became a central bank of central banks. So if central banks need to transfer money, they will do it via the BIS, and it has even evolved more into an organization that acts as a meeting place for central bankers and regulators to coordinate banking regulation, supervision, and monetary policy on a global scale. And the, ba and, and, and the BIS now hosts the so-called Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and Regulation in Banking and the so-called IAIS, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. It's a supranational association in which all, almost all, um, international insurance supervisors cooperate, meet, discuss regulation and supervision and where they coordinate their work. And after the financial crisis, and even before that, central bankers and regulators and supervisors, like for example the FED, FDIC, German BaFin, the Swiss FINMA, uh, in France it's, it's the ACPR, the, I, yeah, it's part of Banque Bank de France, um, the, the French financial supervisor. They meet, they discuss, and they try to come up with common international standards. And Basel II is synonymous for a set of rules installed by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and Regulation and installed with our, within the European Union. So in the 2000s, say 2006, 2007, all the countries in the European Union tried, and well, they, 
they did, but they, after some time, they installed uh, a common set of framework and a common set of rules in banking regulation and supervision. And this set of rules was called Basel II, Basel II. After the financial crisis, we got Basel III and so on. So if you ever hear Basel II, Basel II, Basel III, you know, it's just a common framework within the European Union for banking supervision and banking regulation. And as part of Basel II, Basel II, regulators came up with the idea that banks predominantly are exposed to three types of risk, market risk, credit risk, and everything else summarized as operational risk. That is why in this risk report of Deutsche Bank, you can still see the influence of Basel II in this distinction between credit risk, market risk, operational risk. It's very standard across banks in the European Union. Another thing you can see from this extract from the risk report, they do not express risk in euros potential losses, but they call it risiko capital, ökonomischer Kapitalbedarf, economic capital or risk capital. What is economic capital or risk capital? First, if you ever hear the word capital in the context of banking, usually what is meant by capital is equity. No? Because banks are all about capital. Usually capital and equity is too low. No? But what is risk capital? What is economic capital? It seems to be something different from equity. All those German students, remember, Eigenkapital, equity, debt, Fremdkapital. No? It's all about equity. But what, what is the main difference between equity and risk capital or economic capital? Equity or risk capital and economic capital is basically equity plus a little bit extra from debt. Why? How would you do business if you were a bank? Let's assume you all are the employees of my bank. I'm the manager, you are my traders. And you can trade in the markets and you're supposed to earn money. Now, what we'll do, we can take up a certain amount of risk. How can we measure risk? The easiest way to measure risk is to say, well, I have one million in equity. If everything goes down the drain, I can lose one million in equity before I'm bankrupt. So I can simply say, you can trade almost in the amount of, say, 10,000 euros equity. And if you lose all your money, well, I will lose 10,000 euros equity. I'm not bankrupt, but you have a budget of 10,000 euros. You are a much better trader. I will give you 100,000 equivalent of equity to trade on. And I will budget, and I will give out budgets more or less based on the equity that is available to cover losses. And if all of you trade badly, all of you lose money, my equity is gone, the bank will be bankrupt. So in banking and in many other companies, you will see this idea that the, the budget is based on equity. And because it is not really used in this context, to decide on capital structure or financing decisions, but it's used as a, as, a, as a measure of budgeting risk to different parts of the company. It's called risk capital. And in banking, you go one step further. You assume that in the case of bankruptcy, what can be used to cover losses? You will go bankrupt if you cannot pay your debt. So you will have equity and you will have liabilities and you have to repay your liabilities that are due. But if you have long-term liabilities or some uh, liabilities with, uh, with uh, a senior, um, with higher seniority, that would mean that you do not need to repay those long-term liabilities right now 
but you can repay them later on. So what you do is you take equity, the best kind of equity, and you add some parts of debt. And equity and some parts of debt will make up your risk capital. So you can trade and you can budget, can use as a budget your equity and some parts of debt. There are elaborate rules in place in banking regulation. What can, what can be calculated into risk capital? What can be used as risk capital? And that's a large part of banking regulation. How to calculate your risk capital. And then if you know, for example, you have 5 million, or in this case, let's take Deutsche Bank, they have, say, 10 billion equity and 3 billion debt that is eligible to be used as risk capital, you will have 13 billion euros risk capital, and then you can you can just pull out and, um, and you could put out risk capital across your lines of business. And you can say, okay, I can use 2 billion euros to use in market risk, I can use 5 billion in credit risk, and so on. And this is why risk here in the risk report of Deutsche Bank is described and measured as the required economic capital, ökonomischer Kapitalbedarf. Geben klar? Clear to everyone? It's always in banking, it's always about capital. If you hear anything in the newspapers, if you hear something about Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank merging, you will always hear their capital ratios are too bad. They need more capital, they need more capital, they need more equity. The only difference here between equity and risk capital is that some parts of debt also count towards risk capital. I'll say this one, one more time in German. We'll come back to that later on uh, in the lecture. Risikokapital beinhaltet vor allem nachrangige Verbindlichkeiten. Also all das, was Sie nicht sofort zurückzahlen müssen im Fall der Insolvenz, zählt auch, kann auch mitzählen, anteilig zum Risikokapital. Und die Idee ist einfach, dass der Regulierer, in dem Fall also Bundesbank, EZB, BaFin, die wollen verhindern, dass die Bank pleite geht. Und man geht die Bank pleite, wenn das Eigenkapital aufgebraucht sind, wenn sie überschuldet sind und wenn sie aktuell Fremdkapital auszahlen müssen und ausgeben müssen. Aber nachrangige Verbindlichkeiten, langfristige Verbindlichkeiten, die sind ja nicht sofort fällig. Und deswegen sagt die BaFin und auch Bundesbank, EZB an der Stelle, okay, also für die Kapitalberechnung, kann, können auch bestimmte Fremdkapitalbestandteile mit zum Eigenkapital gezählt werden und dann kommen sie natürlich zu so einer Mischform aus Eigen- und Fremdkapital und das nennt sich dann Risikokapital. These rules on how to calculate risk capital, um, we will see those rules later on, yeah? especially next semester in the introduction to banking. So that's risk capital. Let's come back to types of risk, market price risk, first type of risk. It's rather trivial. Market price risk comprises those risks that arise, that exist because market prices can change. The only thing interesting here is that market price risk obviously comprise the risk that stock prices change, bond prices change, but also exchange rate change. If you ever see a FX stands for foreign exchange, so if you have an FX risk, it means foreign exchange risk, meaning an exchange rate might change. It might be a commodity price risk, the price for steel, the price for coal, the price for energy changes, and interest rates. Interest rates are nothing but the price for getting capital or for taking on capital. So interest rate risk, commodity risk, market price, all these are all market price risks. And then risk management might, be, might change a little bit. One would think that financial risk management is something very new um, because financial markets have only, been, um, bec have only become so elaborate and so complicated since the, say, 80s and 90s. But especially market price risk management is something very, very old. There are some, some, um, some hints in history that even in uh, ancient Mesopotamia, India and Greece, uh, well before Christ, uh, very simple forms of risk management were already used to hedge risk that 
you have a bad year, you have some bad weather, and you lose crops. If you if you are well, these times you only uh, were um, engaging in agriculture and in trade, but in these times uh, you have farmers growing crops. If you, if you have a storm, if you have bad weather, you might lose your crops. And even then, in ancient Greece, you can see some simple ways how farmers tried uh, to hedge against these risks. So it's not really a modern concept. It has only become very complicated due to the complexity of modern financial markets. And you have commodity futures, derivatives exchanges, and the first types and the first examples of futures exchanges uh, actually opened in way before the, the modern times, but in the 15th, well, maybe 16th, 17th century. Uh, okay. But obviously nowadays it's done on a much larger scale and with more complex securities and products. Um, because it's mentioned here, and I just talk, uh, talked about futures exchanges, what is a futures exchange and what is a future? What is a future contract? If you don't know this yet, this is the, the, the best time to learn this. Um, you can distinguish and differentiate between two types of markets with any type of financial product or even um, an industrial product. Spot markets and future markets. If you buy on a spot market, you will buy on the spot right now, maybe with one or two day delay but you are buying something right now and you're paying right now maybe one day or two days later but now a future contract is a contract in which you buy something now but payment and delivery will be done later at a later point in time meaning one year from now five months from now and that is a future contract. Or, to be precise, that's a forward contract. If a forward, I, I describe to you a forward contract. A future contract is a variant of a forward that can be traded on an exchange. In German, we have slightly different words. Kassa Markt, so spot Markt, no? Kassa Preis, oder dann eben der Forward Preis. And forward market. So contrary to spot markets, in a forward contract or a future, that's the exchange traded variant of a forward contract, execution of obligations, delivery and payment are in the future. So you can buy something now, you agree on a price now, but you only have to pay later. You can do the same actually. You can even you can engage in a in a forward contract. Uh, some banks are offering uh, loans and mortgage loans as a, in, a, in a forward variant. So if you think interest rates will increase, you can agree today on a mortgage loan in, say, three or five months, and the bank will in agree to fix the interest rate now for a small price, for a small premium. Or you can try to buy one ton of steel today for the price that is fixed today, and the steel will only be delivered in one year. That's a forward contract, and if it's traded on an exchange, it's a future contract. And the exchange on which futures contracts are traded, these are called futures exchanges. So note that every time we speak of an exchange, in German Börse, you have to make sure and you have, you have to be more specific. Is it a stock exchange? Is it a futures exchange? Is it a commodity exchange? The largest commodity exchange and futures exchange is the CME in Chicago, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It's not a stock exchange. No? Okay, that's a futures exchange. If you don't remember the definitions of market risk, credit risk, and so on, just take the risk report of Deutsche Bank again. Deutsche Bank defines market risk in their risk report. Marktrisiko entsteht durch die Unsicherheit hinsichtlich der Änderung von Marktpreisen und Kursen. Market risk comes into play and comes, uh, becomes into a, um, 
existence by changes in market prices, including interest rates, stock prices, exchange rate, and commodity prices. Same definition as on the slide. Okay. Market price risk uh, from trading, not very interesting here. Just, just remember that a bank just not only gives out loans, it also engages in what we call proprietary trading. The banks will, especially in, West, in investment banking, banks will also trade in stocks, bonds on their own. And if they lose money by trading stocks, well, that's obviously also market risk. Yeah. Commodity risk is very simple. Commodity risk is the risk that market prices for commodities change. Rohstoffpreisrisiken. Commodities could be steel, aluminum, energy, electricity, gas, oil. You, you might know some, some weirder examples. Do you know some, some future contracts that are a little bit weirder than just steel and oil and gas? At this point in the lecture, I usually ask whether one of you knows the movie Trading Places old classic movie with Danny Croyd and Eddie Murphy. No one? Oh, okay. It should be on that. It's a movie about futures exchanges and traders on a futures exchange. And they, at the end, they make a huge bet on frozen orange juice. That's a rather standard commodity that's traded. Frozen orange juice. Pork bellies, grain, uh, wheat, those are other commodities that are frequently traded on futures exchanges. So agricultural pro products, even lard, fat, richtige Schweine und Schweine und Rinderfett, that's also traded on futures exchanges. In these cases, it depends on the type of commodity. Uh, there some, sometimes are some peculiarities to the commodity. Uh, do you know some, 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 some special properties of some commodities? Agricultural products are usually uh, exposed to seasonalities. If it's the season for wheat, if it's the season for, well, it's always season for pork bellies, I guess. Uh, but wheat only grows during some times of the year. Um, maybe a more practical example. And it's a shame that we have our windows to this side, because if they were to the other side, you would see the major place in Europe where some other commodities are traded. Electricity at the EEX, the European Energy Exchange, it's a, it's a spot in a futures market for electricity, but also for CO, CO2 um, certificates and some other things. <laughs> And electricity is a very, very special type of commodity. It cannot be stored, or only, uh, only with hardship. It cannot be easily stored. It has to be transported via a network. So commodity, uh, commodity like electricity is completely different from something that can be transported and stored like, say, frozen orange juice. So it depends, and the risk depends on the type um, of commodity you're looking at. To give you an example how commodity price risks may uh, affect your business, you can see here um, normalized prices for ethylene dichloride, aluminum, at the red line I think, uranium and butadiene on the spot market. They all start at a normalized price at 1 here in 2004. And you can see the changes in the market price for these four different types of commodities. Some commodity prices will not change. If I had included uh, uh, cocoa, uh, you would see even, even more dramatic spikes in the commodity price. At least that's the reason why our, one of my most favorite types of chocolates is becoming more pricier and pricier every month. You know the quadratic ones. Yeah, they are always blaming market world market prices for cocoa, 
that's why they increase the price for chocolate. Right? Well, the market price for cocoa has increased. Yeah, luckily, they are not using uranium, but you can see here that market price for commodities change sometimes very dramatically. And for commodity risk, again, it, it might be interesting for two reasons. The producer of chocolate, for example, really physically needs cocoa. It needs sugar. So it has to buy sugar, cocoa, and some other ingredients on the world market, and it will use it in production. So there's no way... Um, you, you cannot produce chocolate without sugar. Okay. In some other cases, you are only <laughs> affected indirectly because you have some exposure to these commodity prices, but it only indirectly affects your risk exposure. And ca I can give you one example. Um, let me see. Does anyone have? Does anyone has uh, a heating that relies on natural gas, gas heizung? Anyone? Yeah, some of you. The price, the retail price for gas is also very volatile. Changes, goes up and down. And the reason for that is not just production of natural gas and everything that's related to it, but for some reasons, I will not go into detail, the market price for natural gas is linked to the market price of oil, of raw oil. And the price of natural gas is usually it's usually done as a so-called oil price formula. So if the market price for oil, crude oil, changes, your gas bill will change as well. You're not using oil, but for some reason your electricity company and your, your energy company uses the, price, the market price for oil to calculate the price for natural gas because for some reason it may be linked. So you, you, don't, you don't need to use oil to have an exposure to crude oil, to the market price. And that's a difference because, for example, the chocolate producer, it really needs chocolate. It needs sugar, it needs cocoa. But here, in some cases, you have enriched exposure to a commodity price, even though you are not really fully dependent on a 100% physical delivery of this commodity. No? And this happens a lot of times. That's commodity risk. Very important for industrial firms, almost not important and of no importance to financial institutions. No bank needs cocoa, sugar, or pork bellies. But currency risk might be interesting for all companies. Again, also industrial companies, but also financial institutions. Every time you do business in a foreign currency, you have an exposure to currency risk. Very simple example, Toyota produces a car in Japan, sells it in Europe, has to transport the car to Europe, it sells in Euro, workers are paid in Japanese yen. You have a currency exposure. Very simple example. So as soon as you have production costs in one currency and sale revenues in another currency, every company, the perfume store, the shoe shop, every shop and every company will have currency risk. How can you eliminate currency risk? If you think of especially car companies and automobile producers. By buying futures, yes, that's the very sophisticated approach from risk management, but, but what can you also do? What do car manufacturers do all the time? Second reason are tariffs, but what, what are BMW, Daimler, Volkswagen, Toyota, what are they doing? To eliminate currency risk, and for reasons of tariffs, Zölle, they just move part of their production to the country in which they want to sell the cars. That's why BMW, Volkswagen, Daimler, Toyota, they all have production plants in the United States. They are not producing the cars in Europe and shipping them off to the US, but they also produce in the United States for some other reasons. Admittedly, they also want to cater to the market 
as you might know, in the US you need more, uh, you need some special special type of car, you need bigger cars sometimes, uh, you will not be able to sell diesel cars. Um, but one reason is to eliminate currency risk. Okay. So you can also see that in many cases, currency and commodity price risk will go hand in hand. If you buy sugar from, say, Africa, you will have commodity price risk and currency risk. And you need to hedge against both. Okay. I've this here. This is the spot price of crude oil, Brent crude oil. The same commodity, just in dollar and yen. Again, normalized to start at zero in 2005. And as you can see, just because of commodity price risk, it goes up and down. But you can also see that it's not just commodity price risk. There is also, for example, here, there's also a large discrepancy between the price for the same commodity in dollars and in yen. Why is that? And why is there such a big difference here and not here. Any idea? Go back to your basic economics classes. Currency rates are, what do currency rates reflect in exchange rates? More or less. At least they are related to monetary policy. Well, monetary policy is used for what? During times of crisis to start a stimulus for economic growth. And you can see here, after the financial crisis, after 2009, we've con slowly diverging monetary policies by the Fed and by the Bank of Japan. Japan entered the period of what is now called abenomics, of extremely uh, aggressive uh, um, credit expansion and uh, 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 loose monetary policy, whereas the Fed started sooner to increase interest rates and to scale back on their asset purchase programs. So here you can see that at some point monetary policy and the, the general growth in these economies was so different that currency rates drifted apart. And this is why you can see such a high and large difference between the price of oil in dollar and yen. During the financial crisis, no one cared. Yeah? You can see that it was almost the same. So currency risk and commodity risk are usually linked. Now, has the introduction of the euro led to a reduction of currency risk? What do you think? Well, of course, within the European Union. From one country to another country, we can now buy and export and import in one single currency, at least within the euro area. But currency risk, obviously, in relative to countries outside the euro area, might have increased because we have completely different uh, economies within the euro area france germany in contrast to spain italy greece and because the economies are in such different shapes and different positions some are more powerful some are more on the verge of recession even though we have one single currency it could mean that the strong currency in the euro uh, creates more or less problems for some companies from some countries when they export to the US, to other countries outside the European Union, and this might have increased some types of currency risk. But within the euro area, obviously, we, have no, we no longer have currency risk. Next, securities risk. Very, very simple. If you buy a bond, if you buy a security, if you buy a stock, 
if the price changes, well, you lose money. You might lose money. Very, very simple. Um, well, I guess I don't need to, to talk more about this. I think they should be clear. If you own an, if you own a stock, well, you risk losing everything. It can go down. I want to stress the fact that securities risk not only includes stock market and stock price risk, but also bond, bond price risk. Is everyone clear about what a bond is? In German, Anleihe. Everyone knows what a bond is? Okay, it's a securitized form of debt. And bonds also have market prices. And if you invest in a corporate bond or a government bond, prices again may increase, may decrease, and then you have also risk stemming from the market price risk from a bond. In some cases, these, ins uh, these securities uh, will pay out interest rates. For example, a corporate bond is a very simple structure. A corporate bond will look like this. If you, if you, if you buy a corporate bond at the time of issuance, I will give the company who is, which is issuing the bond uh, a notional value of 100, Let's say the coupon is 5%, so we'll get five, a payment of 5 euros say, each and every year. And at the end, I will get 105. That's a very simple form of a coupon bond, a coupon anleihe. You pay 100 if it's issued. You give a loan to the company in the amount of 100 euros and you will get 5 euros each year as an interest rate payment and in the end you will get 5 interest rate and you will get your notional value back so you will get 105 that's a simple cash flow for a corporate bond same with a uh, government bond and a sovereign bond do you know what the difference between a corporate bond and a sovereign bond is? Unternehmensanleihe, Staatsanleihe Where's the major difference between a corporate bond and a sovereign bond? First of all, two differences. First difference is most of us retail customers will never be able to buy into a sovereign bond. Sovereign bonds are issued at a much larger scale in the billions and billions of euros, dollars, etc. And only institutional investors will be able to buy into a sovereign bond. There sometimes can be small and medium-sized enterprises that will issue micro-bonds. I know one uh, company in Germany that issued a micro-bond and they sold parts of their bonds, starting at, I think, 5,000 euros in butcher shops. It was, a, it was a sausage factory. They needed, like, say, 10 or 20 million euros, and they sold it as a micro-bond to retail customers. That's one difference. So... Sometimes you might be able to buy into a micro bond, into a micro corporate bond, but even corporate bonds are usually just restricted to institutional investors, banks, insurance companies like that. But what's the second major difference between a corporate bond and most sovereign bonds? Yeah? Sovereign bonds should be more secure. Yeah. Usually, if the country has a triple A rating, like, say, Germany, the sovereign bond is regarded to be risk-free. The corporate bond, well, the risk of the corporate bond depends on the default risk of the company. If the company goes bankrupt, they will not repay their bonds. So the interest rate payment for the corporate bond should be higher than that of a risk-free sovereign bond. You will not get 5% for a sovereign bond of Germany. You will be lucky to get 0.2 or 0.3%. And 5% interest rate for a corporate bond, that's very risky uh, in times of zero interest rates. But you can see here, this is the cash flow at issuance, when it's issued, but at emission. What happens afterwards is, I'm now a small company. I'm selling my bond to you. I'm selling micro bonds. You can 
perhaps you buy five bonds for 10,000 euros, you buy 20,000 euros in bonds, you only buy 2,000 euros in bonds. Now I get capital, I get debt. And after that, you, as investors on the secondary market, you can try to trade your bonds. Suddenly, I'm closing in on bankruptcy and you realize you want your money back. You cannot get it back from me until maturity, but you can try to sell your bonds to your colleague. And in that case, you paid, let's say, 10,000 euros. You realize it's only worth 1,000. You're trying to get 1,000 from her and she will agree, well, okay, I will give you 800. And that's when market prices for bonds will be built on the secondary market, on the bond market. And here, you will have a price, P. And you can see that for an interest-bearing security, like a bond, and we usually refer to these instruments as fixed income products. Fixed income meaning that these securities pay a fixed interest rate. 5% each year, for example, in this case. For fixed income products, the prices and market price risk will depend on interest rates. Why? This is basic finance 101. How, how should the market price for such a bond look like? Let's assume that's the payment. These are the payments of the corporate bond. How would you determine the arbitrage-free price on a complete and perfect market? Arbitrage-free means the fair market price. How would you calculate the price of such a bond? It pays 5% interest rate. You should ask me a question. What do you need? calculate the price again basic finance 101 yeah the current interest rate on the market it makes a difference if this let's assume I have this corporate bond it's risk-free it pays five percent and if I look at the interest rates from central bank and interest rates are charging and the interest rates on the market are 8%. Why should I invest in this bond if I can get 8% risk-free on the market? This is not a good investment. If interest rates are only at 1% and the risk of 1% investment and this corporate bond, the risk is the same, well, then this is a very great investment. So what I do, need to do is I have to discount all these payments. You should have done this in the second year. No, four. And you will get the price, the present value of this cash flow stream. Very simplistic way, but actually that's how it's done. And now, if this market interest rate changes for a similar risky investment. If the interest rates goes up, you have high opportunity costs, price for this bond should go down. If the interest rate goes down, the market price for this bond should go up. And that's how interest rates, market interest rates, will influence the risk, the price risk, of interest-bearing fixed income products. So even though you can buy into a bond and it has a fixed income, one would think, well, if I get a fixed payment of 555, 105, I have no risk at all because it's all fixed. Well, no, the market price, the resale value of this bond will change. And if in between you want to sell your bond, market prices for this bond will have changed. Okay. And obviously, I gave you this example that if I'm a bank, if I'm a company and I issue a bond, if my default rate, if my default probability changes, if I'm doing exceptionally well, if I'm doing exceptionally badly, if I'm closing in on bankruptcy, my credit risk will change and the bond will also change in value. 
no one will buy a bond of a normal defunct company. So that's credit, no, that's, yeah, that's also credit risk as part of market price risk. So again, you can see that in many cases, you will see everything. You will see a security that is traded in dollars. You will see a bond that has market price risk, but also interest rate risk, and so on. So many, thing, many times these risks are combined. Interest rate risk. Now, we've already seen one type of interest rate risk if you buy fixed income products. The second source of interest rate risk is with banking when banks give out loans. If you give out a loan, uh, an insurance, actually insurance companies face even more interest rate risk. If you give out a loan to a customer and you guarantee and you fix an interest rate payment of 2%, this interest rate will stay the same. To give you a very practical example uh, from my life, I inherited a mortgage loan from my parents. My, my parents agreed on that loan in 2010. They are paying 3 point, or now I'm, unfortunately, uh, I'm paying 3.65% on this mortgage loan. Currently, mortgage loan rates are something where near 1%. They fixed it for 10 years, so next year I will be celebrating because I will go to my bank and I will tell my bank, well, you can stick it with your 3.65%. I want my 1%. Yeah? I want my money back. And in this case, the bank was lucky. They fixed an interest rate of almost 4%, and market interest rates went down and they are earning a lot on those old loan contracts. Right now, they're giving out loans at almost just 1%. And if at some point, interest rate, market interest rates were to increase again, well, they will, will have high opportunity costs. They will only earn like 1% on these mortgage loans, although they could earn 3 or 4% risk-free on the market. So it can go either way. Do you know why it's the almost the same case with insurance companies, just the other way around? Insurance companies are not celebrating on these old contracts. Do you know why? And what is the problem? You're quite sleepy today. No idea. In insurance. What is the most Dramatic problem of German insurance companies right now. Why, why are insurance companies doing so badly, especially in Germany, also in some other European countries? Because of life insurance. What has happened in life insurance? Basically the same thing. They agreed to accept money as part of a life insurance contract, and they guaranteed a certain minimum interest rate on those life insurance policies. And these life insurance policies were uh, agreed upon 10, 20, 30 years ago when interest rates were almost at 4, 5, even 6%. So they have a lot of contracts that will be paid out now that have guaranteed interest payments and interest rates of 5 or 6% plus an additional interest rate and how are insurance companies what are what is the core of their business they are taking in uh, premiums from contracts and they are investing the money to earn a higher return so that they can guarantee like two or three or four percent on these life insurance policies well they're having a very hard time to earn those six seven or eight percent they have to pay out now on these very old contracts and that's why many life insurance contracts, um, life insurance companies are merging, are selling off, are going into a runoff, or are just going bankrupt. Because they can no longer, they can no longer earn such a high return, but they have to pay out this high return on those old life insurance contracts. Uh, can I say it in German? Das ist die Mindestverzinsung in den Lebensversicherungsverträgen. Hm? Sie haben eine Mindestverzinsung, und wenn die Verträge in den 80er, 
90er Jahren abgeschlossen worden sind, dann müssen die Lebensversicherer da teilweise 5, 6, 7 Prozent drauf zahlen. Und wenn die Marktzinsen bei 0 Prozent liegen, versuchen sie mal 7, 8 Prozent zu erwirtschaften, um das bezahlen zu können. Das sind Altverträge, die sind garantiert und die müssen ausgezahlt werden. Die Lebensversicherung, so wie sie damals kannten, ist in der Form tot. Heutzutage, sie werden alle keine Lebensversicherung mehr abschließen. Was soll die Versicherung Ihnen sagen? Zahl 30 Jahre ein und kriegst 0,5 Prozent. Ja, herzlichen Spaß auch. Ne? Das ist also Lebensversicherung, Life Insurance is in this form, classic traditional German Life Insurance is almost dead. Yeah? And you can see that Life Insurance companies are merging, uh, are selling off their assets and so on. That's interest rate risk. Highly, very important for banks and insurance companies. And this is a very practical example of how interest rate risk will affect banks. Yeah. Okay. I have two examples here. You can now imagine that loans, bond investments, life insurance contracts, they all are exposed to interest rate risk. And with interest rate risk, we usually mean changes in the interest rates of central banks because all other interest rates will will follow market interest rates uh, and interest rates uh, set by central banks is anyone studying economics or does anyone want to concentrate on economics at least one um, I, I always want to stress two things uh, on a side note. First of all, always remember there is not just one price for any security. You will always have two prices. One for buying a security and one for selling one. You have a bid and ask price. And when it comes to interest rate and market interest rates, you will not have one market and one interest rate. In our theoretical models, we will usually talk of R. R being the interest rate, the risk-free interest rate on the market. But what is R? In fact, you can distinguish several types of interest rates that could be considered a market interest rate. First of all, you have to remember that each and every central, banks, central bank sets certain interest rates. For example, when a bank wants to um, um, lend money from the central bank or in case they want to deposit money with the central bank. That's where you have certain interest rates and currently the European Central Bank, you might know this, it actually charges a negative interest rate if banks deposit money and carry short term with the European Central Bank. Those are the negative interest rates everyone is talking about. Then, German doesn't the light sin, no? the, the major interest rate set by central banks. But you can also look at other risk-free rates. Does anyone maybe know how you can calculate the, the risk-free rates we usually use in empirical economics if we are not using these interest rates sent, uh, set by central banks? Any idea? You go to the bond market, to the sovereign bond market, and you look at the sovereign bonds by a country that is risk-free, considered to be risk-free, say German sovereign bonds. The German state issues sovereign bonds from time to time. And if, for example, Germany uh, pays out 0.1% interest rate on its government bonds, you will use this market information and try to extract the time varying and the yield curve uh, from these bonds and the interest rates. That's how you calculate the risk-free rate. You know, that's how we sometimes get to R. For example, if you see that you have a 30-year government bond by Germany, issued by Germany, and it pays out 1%, your interest rate for a maturity of 30 years should be almost close to 1%. That's why, another reason why, if you take a newspaper, the newspaper will report on the prices of government bonds because it will give you an indication of mar what market, pri market interest rates are. Okay, but I'm digressing, I guess. You also have some other market interest rates. Uh, for, for example, the Euribor. There are European Union uh, interbank offered rate. Uh, 
we also sometimes talk of the LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate. I guess nowadays after the Deutsche Bank successfully, supposedly successfully mani manipulated the LIBOR, uh, we should rather stick to the EURIBOR. The, it's, it's an interest rate that is used by banks if a bank A needs a loan from bank B. So that's the interbank market, the interbankenmarkt, where banks grant loans to each other, not to customers. This is a very special market because you cannot really observe the offered rates, the interest rates bank charge to each other. What will happen is that the banks have agreed to report the interest rates they have agreed upon in confidential contracts and then someone takes all these uh, reported interbank offered rates and they will calculate the Euribor and the Libor. You might have heard that this requires banks and banks were supposed to be honest about the offered rates. And Deutsche Bank had a big scandal that, um, that showed that Deutsche Bank didn't report the true offered rates they charge, but they reported slightly different offer rates and they traded on that. They tried to, to scam investors and some other banks. If, if you know that you can influence the, this interest rate by reporting a false offered rate, you can try to exploit that. And that's what Deutsche Bank did and that's the Libor scandal of Deutsche Bank. That's interest rate risk. A very simple example. Here you have a coupon bond with a nominal amount of 100 and a current risk-free interest rate of 10%. And just like I showed you, you can calculate the net present value of this uh, cash flow. If you take 100 in bond one, you will get an arbitrage-free price of 90.90. If you take bond two, you have 100 and it's 75.13. And if you increase the market interest rate to just 12%, bond prices will go down because you're using different discount factors. If you change interest rate again to, say, 8%, you will also have a slightly different price that will be higher. Now, if you have four risk-free coupon, coupon bonds, Again, with a notional amount, a notional value of 100 and a coupon of 2% and a current risk-free market interest rate of 1.5%, you have four bonds and everything else equal. The price of a coupon bond decreases as the maturity of the nominal amount approaches. And you can do a lot of these examples with coupon bonds. I just want to show you that interest rate risk is not just limited to loans. It's not just the risk that you can only give out a loan at a higher or lower interest rate, but every time you deal in fixed income products, you will have interest rate risk. Okay. Uh, we spoke about the sovereign bonds, and nothing much happened with German sovereign bonds, but to get an idea of what can go wrong with sovereign bonds, you only need to look at this. What is this? It's a government bond, but does anyone see or anyone know what government bond this is? What sovereign bond? No one? It's the Hellenic Republic. What's the Hellenic Republic? That's Greece. Hellenische Republic. It's the official name of Greece, Griechenland. So this is Greek sovereign bond. And this Greek sovereign bond was issued in 95. Those were great times. At that time, they paid 5.8% interest on their sovereign bond. And as you can see, it will mature. It's a little bit older, this slide. It will mature or it matured on the 14th of July 2015, meaning this is a 20-year government bond. So it had a maturity of 20 years, paid out a 5.8% coupon, and down here, you can see the chart. Uh, the, this, this here, the course, so this is the price. 
And with sovereign bonds, during the sovereign crisis, euro crisis, you might have heard things in the news like the, the yields on Greek sovereign bonds have increased. The rate of return on Greek sovereign bonds has increased. The yield has increased. Yeah, same, same in German. The rendite for Griechische Staatsanleihen is gestiegen. And this sounds very nice. Higher yield? Everyone wants a higher yield. Everyone wants a higher return, right? Problem is, why did these bonds have a higher yield? They have a fixed payment of 5.8%. So if everyone's selling off Greece, uh, Greek sovereign bonds, because everyone expecting that Greek is, uh, Greece is defaulting, you can buy a Greek sovereign bond for, in the most extreme case, for here, almost five euros. Five euros for a sovereign bond that will repay 105.8 in four months. Now that's a great deal. If Greece doesn't default. Well, it didn't. I actually know some people who exploited this dramatically. I know some consultants and some people who had money to gamble with. They had, they, they came up with some ideas to buy up Greek, uh, Greek sovereign bonds. And you can see if you buy for five and you, you're expected to get repaid 105.8 in less than four months, that's a sweet deal. And they just expected and they speculated that no one would let Greece default. Didn't happen. And this was, I guess, a good investment back then. So every time the bond prices go down the internal rate of return, that is the yield, the internal rate of return will go up dramatically. So if you hear the yields on the sovereign bonds are increasing, always think of it that bond prices are going down, everyone's selling them, no one wants them. No? Okay. So is this interest rate risk, is it credit risk? Well, with the sovereign bond here of Greece, this is not just interest rate risk. The changes, the dramatic changes in the market price here, the blue one is, by the way, Greece. The red line is the price of a German sovereign bond at the same time. This dramatic increase, by the way, here down to almost 20 euros for a 100 euro bond, back again here to uh, almost 90. That was the end when everyone realized, okay, Greece is not defaulting and we, we can survive the euro crisis. This here, this change here, this is not interest rate risk. This is credit risk. Everyone was expecting Greece to default and later they realized, okay, we will do everything, whatever it takes to save the euro zone. Yeah? Why? is the price of the German sovereign bond staying above 100. If a bond is risk-free and the repayment, the notional value is 100, as you are closing in on maturity, on the maturity date, if I were to give you 100 euros at the end of this lecture, how much would you pay for 100 euros? for a bond worth of 100 euros. If I would say I will sell you a bond and I will give you a notional value of 100 euros in say 10 minutes, how much would you pay for that? 100 euros, maybe 100 euros and one cent, but you wouldn't pay 99 euros. So the price of the bond will converge to the notional value as maturity comes closer and closer. If everything is risk-free. With Greece, you can see, well, it was risky. 
So we've already explained the different price evolutions of the government bonds, and this is obviously the euro crisis. Okay. That's market price risk. Let's turn to credit risk. Credit risk. If a firm holds receivables from private persons, retail customers, other firms, banks, etc., and there might be a chance that you're not able to recover your receivables, your company is exposed to credit risk. This is one major uh, take from this. You don't need to be a bank to, expose, to be exposed to credit risk. If I go to the shoe shop and I take a shoe pair with me and I pay later, the company is already exposed to credit risk. I might default on my obligation, on my liability, and almost all companies are exposed to some sort of credit risk. By the way, German word for receivables is Every time you sell something and you expect payment in the future, so you have receivables on your balance sheet, you're exposed to credit risk. That is why many industrial companies, not just financial institutions, have credit risk management. Sometimes you also have uh, something that's called counterparty default risk. We'll talk about this uh, in a couple of slides. So for banks, obviously, credit risk is one major concern. They give out loans. Loans can be, can, uh, people can default on their loans. Uh, so this is a major risk exposure to banks. Um, but in the end, every industrial company usually is exposed to credit risk. If uh, there is a slight chance that you will not be able to recover your um, receivables, you have credit risk. Sometimes uh, we are not calling this credit risk, but debt risk, debitorenrisiko in German. Meaning that you, you haven't given credit to someone, you haven't given out a loan, but you are simply expecting someone to pay up his bills or her bills as debitorn risiko and it will play a lesser role in retail business and industrial firms but it it is existent i think i've told you about this example in energy companies in electricity companies if you do not pay your electricity bill they will cut off electricity but still the electricity company has credit risk because it needs to recover two or three electricity bills from you. Risk management is slightly easier in this case, but it's still credit risk. We distinguish and differentiate between two types of credit risk, in a strict sense and in a wider sense. Credit risk in engeren, credit risk in weiteren Sinn. Credit risk in a strict sense is just one, zero. Default, no default. Payment, full payment, no payment. Credit risk in a wider sense means the probability of you defaulting on your obligation, on your liability, has increased. So there's a continuum between zero and one, a probability that you are going to repay your loan, that you're going to repay um, what you owe a company. In many cases, for example, in this case of the electricity company, the company will just deal with credit risk in a strict sense. You pay your electricity bill or you don't pay your electricity bill. Well, because it's just 50 euros, maybe. If you give out a loan, like Deutsche Bank, to Bayer, to Daimler, if they give out a loan to Donald Trump, which apparently they did, they have to care about credit risk in a broader sense. They have to think about the rating, the credit risk, the default probability of their business partner. And if their default probability of their business partner changes, they need to take certain steps at some milestones and some red lights will go up and they will say, okay, we are, we are seeing now that the credit risk has increased. We need to charge a higher rate of a higher interest rate. We need to do something about this credit risk. So credit risk in a strict sense is usually dealt with in retail business. And if you enter wholesale business, large scale business, you will have to deal with ratings, 
credit risk in a wider sense, in a broader sense. Okay. Next, counterparty risk. You have to think of credit risk in a more general way. And if we generalize credit risk, it means counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is the risk that a counterparty in a business contract cannot or does not fulfill its obligations. In a sense, you are exposed to counterparty risk. You've entered university, you've paid a small fee, but still you've paid a small fee. If I don't turn up and give this lecture, you've already paid up, you've paid your fee, you've invested your time and money, and I, as some sort of business partner in a contract, in a social contract, I'm not living up to my obligation. Then you are exposed to credit risk. Strange example, let's make it more realistic. You are a large company, and you try to enter a contract OTC over the counter in an OTC market, meaning that you're not buying a standardized security, but you want to uh, come up with a contract with another large company that you exchange cash flows. The, now, it might be that you haven't paid something to the other company, but you're expecting the other company to fulfill its obligation at some point in time. If the other company now goes bankrupt, you suddenly are left without a contract partner. And this is a very similar case to the case of you buying an insurance contract. What happens if the insurance contract goes bankrupt? Assume you have a car insurance. Your car is not yet in an accident, but you are expecting the insurance company to pay in case something happens. Now, what happens if the insurance company goes bankrupt and then you have an accident? You are left without insurance. There's one case where this has now happened in a totally different industry with retail customers. Does anyone know? Also a type of credit risk, but rather counterparty risk in electricity companies. Some electricity companies and electricity vendors have gone bankrupt and people have already paid and now they are left uh, with uh, no service and uh, they lost their money. So that's counterparty risk. Counterparty risk has become very famous during the financial crisis. In the financial crisis, one famous company, insurance company, AIG, American International Group, was not only a large insurance company, but AIG was the major counterparty in the so-called CDS market, in the market for credit default swaps. Credit default swaps are a very, um, oh, let's make it, um, yeah, I still have five minutes so I can wander off. Has anyone of you seen the movie, oh, the Christian Bale financial crisis movie, what's it called? Trading places. The big short. What does Christian Bale do during the financial crisis? He's the manager of a. Ha Anybody? Some of you have seen it. If not, go see it. There are not too many, many great movies about financial markets. Yeah, Wolf of Wall Street, Wall Street, and The Big Short. So you have to watch at least one of these three movies. What does Christian Bale do? Or his character, he goes to Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan and says, I have these investments and I want to buy insurance against the default of these funds. So this is an OTC contract. He doesn't go to a stock exchange, but he goes directly to an investment bank and says, I've seen these mortgage portfolios. I want to buy insurance against the default of these mortgage portfolios. The investment bankers laugh. Well, if you want to pay a premium, well, we'll take your premium. These portfolios are completely free of risk. They will never default. And he says, okay, I want to buy insurance in the notional amount of, say, $100 million. And the CDS contract is very simple. We have Christian Bale here as a fund manager. Let's say we have JP Morgan. I think it's Morgan Stanley, but let's say JP Morgan. 
And we have a reference unit. That's the portfolio here. So what happens is Bale pays a premium of, say, 3% on $100 and million. JP Morgan only pays out 100 million in case the portfolio here, the mortgages go bankrupt or a reference unit goes bankrupt. That's a credit default swap. You swap credit risk with a counterparty. This is a very nice instrument, actually. It's an OTC contract. And during the financial crisis and before the financial crisis, many companies thought of this as a very nice way to buy insurance against the default of a reference unit. And the reference unit can also be another company, another bank. You can buy and you can enter a CDS contract, for example, based on Deutsche Bank, meaning I pay 3% premium, and if Deutsche Bank goes bankrupt, I will get a notional value of, say, 5 or 10 million. Depends on how many CDS contracts you buy. This is nice. And do you know how the movie ends? Then switching again to Steve Carell's character. In the end, they realize, well, this is nice, and this is a nice insurance. Only one thing should not happen. What? If JP Morgan goes bankrupt, you are left with no insurance. The contract is worthless. And this is counterparty risk. It's not the default risk of your reference unit, but it's the default risk of your more or less your insurance company. And during the financial crisis, the Fed and all regulators worldwide had to realize one thing. It wasn't JP Morgan, but AIG was the insurance part in almost 50-60% worldwide of all of these credit default swap contracts. All the banks had bought insurance against the default of investment banks, portfolio, etc. But it was always AIG who sold the CDS contracts. If AIG had gone bankrupt during the financial crisis, the whole financial market would have gone even more down the drain than it already did. That's why AIG was bailed out. AIG is an insurance company and has been to the present day more or less the only insurance company of major significance of major significance that has been bailed out by a state. It wasn't bailed out because insurance was systemic. It was bailed out because they were a major player in the CDS market that had nothing to do with retail insurance. In German, AIG war zwar eine Versicherung, aber die sind nicht wegen ihres Versicherungsgeschäfts gerettet worden, nicht wegen ihrer Häuslerversicherung oder ihrer Lebensversicherung. Die wurden gerettet, weil sie größte Gegenpartei im weltweiten CDS-Markt waren. Und wenn, sie, wenn AIG pleite gegangen wäre, hätten alle Investmentbanken plötzlich mit runtergezogenen Hosen da gestanden. Die hatten sich alle darauf verlassen, dass sie über die CDS-Kontrakte äh, Kontrakte abgesichert waren gegen den Ausfall von äh, anderen Fonds, anderen Investmentbanken etc. Aber AIG war die einzige Gegenpartei. Und, and again, switching to English, CDS contracts are OTC contracts. So if your business partner goes out of business, there's no guarantee. The contract is more or less worthless. That's the major difference between an OTC contract and an exchange-traded contract on a stock exchange. You know? The exchange will guarantee payment and delivery. That's counterparty risk. Quite known and quite interesting nowadays, but up to the financial crisis, no one cared about counterparty risk. So these are some subtypes of credit risk, replacement risk from derivatives, issuer risk, fulfillment risk, country risk. Anytime a business partner defaults, you might get in trouble. So again, credit risk is not just the risk that you might lose a loan as a bank, but credit risk is everywhere. Every time you have a contract with a business partner, that could be counterparty risk. How can you try to circumvent this problem nowadays? You install what is referred to as a central counterparty. You try to divert these contracts via a central institution that creates market transparency, 
and that guarantees payment and guarantees fulfillment, and you try to convert the OTC market into some kind of regulated, transparent, exchange-based market. So that's the contrary or the difference between OTC and um, exchange traders. Um, contract. What happens in these markets is uh, a central counterparty guarantees the so-called clearing. And clearing in an exchange means that a company guarantees and processes all the payments uh, and delivery uh, of the traded goods. If you, t uh, if you go to the website of the European Energy Exchange or the German Stock Exchange, you will see that they not only operate the exchange, but they also have a subsidiary that is a clearing house, a company that offers clearing services for all market participants. It's quite simple. If I buy a stock, if you sell a stock, we have a stock exchange. The stock exchange will match our orders. You need to pay your, you, no, you're selling the stock. You need to deliver the stock to the exchange. The exchange will deliver the stock to me, to my account. I have to pay up. The, sto uh, the stock exchange will transfer the payment to you. If you default, if I default, it's still guaranteed. The stock exchange makes sure and assures that all these payments are guaranteed. However, all these payments need to be cleared. So the payment services, the clearing is done by the stock exchange or a subsidiary of the stock exchange. That's clearing. And you will have clearing houses with exchanges. That's the major difference between an OTC contract and an exchange traded contract. Yeah, I talked about the AIG case. 85 billion bailout, major seller of credit default swap. You can have a look at that later on. And just to show you again that banks report on credit risk as well, you have here an extract of BZEP. DZ Bank, DZ Bank Group, that's the head institute of German mutual banks, German Volksbanken, and they show the required risk capital for loans in the financial sector, to the public sector, to corporate customers, in the retail customer segment, and this is how they show how much credit risk exposure they have. But now, you have not just been quiet when answering questions, but you have been, you have not been complaining yet that I have uh, uh, stretched the lecture a little bit. Do you have any questions concerning credit risk, market risk? Doesn't seem to be the case, so thank you for your attention and see you next time. Thank you.